coming up. We have a, an independent justice who has um, issued an interim uh, report pronounced on this issue, and we have the head of government, the prime minister, um, saying something different. What, uh, what, are we to, what are we to take from that? Back in March at this committee, uh, I brought up that when Mr. Barrett and Conservatives bring up words like cover-up and corruption, it ends up leading to um, my inbox filling up with, with just horrible messages. I want to begin with you, Mr. El Rauer. You had mentioned or proposed a nonpartisan fact-checking commission or body. I think all three of you would agree that uh, the misinformation, disinformation uh, campaign that has been happening for several years now, and at least uh, throughout the 2019-2021 election and currently uh, in this country, has substantially impacted Canadians' confidence in our democratic institutions. But also the, the Deputy Prime Minister uh, posted a video that ended up being flagged on Twitter as being edited. You know, this guy's garage. Like and subscribe. I want to welcome all three of you to our committee today on this important study. So to mitigate the problem with disinformation, I suggest creating a nonpartisan fact-checking initiative at the House of Commons. Over the years, um, we've had information uh, being used as a weapon uh, to target um, well, whoever the opponent is, but we used to call it propaganda. Members of Parliament and candidates' office can be sources of misinformation and disinformation. Uh, my questions are for you, Mr. Lowen. Uh, in what ways does the communist dictatorship in Beijing use misinformation to influence the Chinese diaspora community here in Canada? So thank you very much for the uh, for the question. Um, it's this is not an area on which I have in which I have precise expertise, but if I wanted to so I'm not going to take long to to say it, but but the the most effective way that this can happen, as I've seen it, is by inserting into the ecosystem ideas about what political candidates would do or what parties would do, and then allowing individuals who are interested in politics and like to talk about it to spread those ideas. So if you think about it as an infection and then a virus that spreads, that's a much more that's like a, an effective mental model for understanding how the CCP wants to influence uh, voters' views during elections. Based on, on that uh, prescription, do you believe that the dictatorship in Beijing has been successful in uh, their misinformation campaigns in Canada? So this is a very difficult question in, in my view, Mr. Mr. Barrett, to answer, and I, I appreciate your asking it, but I'll just say it quickly on, on, on two levels. Suppose that, the, that the, the Communist Party in China has spread misinformation about the positions of parties or voters in ways that are, that are, uh, that are untrue and that are, that are damaging, or might, perhaps they are true about positions, but they've spread those ideas and amplified them. Um, that may have had the effect of changing voters' views and changing the views, particularly of Chinese-Canadian voters. It's very hard empirically to say so. But even if it didn't, Mr. Barrett, the, the, the potentially equal effect is that we've spent all this time wondering if the integrity of our elections has been, has been disrupted. And that is something that non-democratic regimes want us to do. They want us to wonder whether the integrity of our elections has been, has been, uh, has been corrupted. And the only thing to do then is take very seriously that possibility. Along with uh, misinformation, we heard in testimony at this, community, at this committee from the Chinese diaspora community that uh, Beijing's campaign of influence and interference goes beyond uh, disinformation and it extends to threats uh, targeting the well-being of members of, of that community, especially family members that might be in mainland China. I, is that uh, tactic uh, something that's typical of foreign state actors to pair their online campaigns with, uh, with real-world uh, threats and targeting? I, I, I don't have the expertise to comment on that. Uh, are you familiar with uh, Justice Hoag's report, uh, that um, the interim report that was published? I am. Um, so I have, a, I have a couple quick questions with respect to that. On the 11th of April, uh, the Prime Minister said that, quote, it wasn't simply an, over, an overall the election was free and fair, but that, quote, every single constituency election 
the election integrity held, and it was free and fair, end quote. So Justice Hogue's conclusions uh, indicated otherwise. She concluded that well-grounded suspicion about the PRC interference in, for example, Don Valley North, quote, could have impacted who was elected to Parliament. This is significant. Justice Hogue further concluded that in Steveston, Richmond East, she found that, quote, there are strong indications of PRC involvement and there is a reasonable possibility that these narratives could have impacted the result in, these, in this riding, end quote. So we have a, an independent justice who has um, issued an interim uh, report pronounced on this issue, and we have the head of government, the prime minister, um, saying something different. What, uh, what, are we to, what are we to take from that um, when we're looking at uh, the, the upside for, um, for one individual, in this case the prime minister, uh, to um, take an interpretation that we would say is far too generous, but you know, it, it could be perceived as uh, being misinformation. So, Mr. Baird, I, I read the Prime Minister's statement as definitive, and I read the statement of Justice Hogue as being one with uncertainty, where she's saying, we don't, we don't know, but it's possible. Um, and I'll tell you that as a person who's spent now um, the better part of 15 years as a practicing academic, studying elections very closely, trying to figure out why some writings are won and some writings are lost, um, Justice Hogue has the correct position. We cannot be sure that each and every uh, riding in Canada in the 2021 election was not influenced by China. And for the prime minister to say that he's absolutely certain that, that Chinese influence had no effect is not a sustainable position. So what does that say then to, uh, to Canadians, uh, Canadians who are members of, um, of certain diaspora communities, uh, but to Canadians writ large, uh, when uh, the head of government is asserting something that um, there is no certainty about, as, um, as, you, uh, as you inferred from Justice Hogue's uh, interim report. 30-second response, Mr. Hogue. Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's, a, that's largely a political question. I don't mean that to dodge it, but, but, but what that says about the Prime Minister and his judgment is, is, is for Canadians to decide. Say, uh, with the remaining 15 seconds, that it's um, it's a political decision and not one that's in the best interest of Canadians. Thanks. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the um, the way that online disinformation gets turned into um, real wor world experiences for for politicians, and and in particular uh, the role that politicians themselves play in in that it, it's I've decided not to run in the next election largely because of the the atmosphere uh, that has developed here in Canada and you know I recall when we were studying Bill C-21 at committee um, the the no, nonpartisan officials were receiving threats and the chair repeatedly had to warn uh, conservative party members about the tone that they were using with with uh, the witnesses um, back in March at this committee, uh, I brought up that when Mr. Barrett and Conservatives bring up words like cover-up and corruption, it ends up leading to um, my inbox filling up with, with just horrible messages. And to that, I was called a pearl clutcher. And let, yet last week, when Mr. Chu was here and talked about his experience on social media, I think Mr. Couric called him a hero. It speaks to the the obvious um, uh, views that politicians hold of, of perhaps women in politics, but I, I can't count the number of times I've been called a, a pearl clutcher, and the new one is a cry bully from the gun lobby, which seems to have spread repeatedly. I just wonder what responsibility do you think politicians have to ensure that they're not fanning the flames that lead to threats and uh, real-world violence against politicians? And I, I'd like to get hear from all three of you on this. Um, Maybe, uh, Mr. Lowen, if you want to start. Um, I'm happy just to say, say two things very, very quickly, Madam Demoff. The first is that um, I was, just if I could say personally, I was sad to see that you have, have decided not to reoffer, and, and the reasons that you've given are, are, are I, I know, very real and genuine and, and serious. Um, 
I think we have, um, we're arriving at a place where the disinhibition that social media allows for um, really allows people to view, come to views about politicians which are which are unfair and which are which are incorrect. Um, this is not our House of Commons is not filled with people who are corrupt, looking for personal enrichment, who are who are set on selling out the country, and yet. Um, uh, people in the public uh, often hold that often hold that belief. So this this kind of rising cynicism and a lack of trust in government is 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 a very serious problem, and it's a serious problem that's going to hurt any party when it when it is um, when it is in government. Um, how you fix it is a whole other is a whole other matter, and one on which I'd love to hear other people's views. I'm going to go to uh, Mr. Frank and then uh, Mr. Al Rawi, if that's okay. I'm, I'm very sorry that this is uh, the circumstance that um, has occurred and the reactions to it by um, others, including other MPs. Um, it's not fair, um, but given this situation um, and the ability for um, social media to spread um, information and give uh, rise to voices that are um, untrue and are mal intended um, foreign or domestic. Um, I, I don't know what the solution is. Um, this is, I think, just going to get uh, worse and worse as um, our, uh, our trust in uh, government in uh, the MPs is undermined. It could be foreign um, or it could be not. Uh, and that's one of the problems that we won't know if unless we really dig into it and, and uh, develop some defenses uh, against this. Mr. Al Rawi. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. And I'm very sorry, uh, MP, for your decision. And I understand uh, this is uh, uh, a problem we are facing in Canada. And uh, the research I have conducted with my team uh, about the Canadian public uh, interactions with Canadian politicians, we've seen a lot of these examples. Whatever happens in the parliament, will be directly echoed on social media and other sites. And uh, unfortunately, some politicians use what we call edutainment. So they try to uh, agitate the public uh, with entertainment. So, and the result will be a lot of memes directed at a lot of uh, uh, politicians, unfortunately. The purpose is, of course, to uh, belittle them uh, with due respect and maybe make fun of them. But at the same time, it creates uh, more divisions, unfortunately. So I believe that there is a need for a more civil discourse, especially that the, the, you are the like representing all of Canada and the parliament on, yeah, like this is the case. Thank you. Okay. I, I, I didn't ask the question to, I appreciate the, the kind comments from all three witnesses. I wasn't, I wasn't trying to make this about me. I'm, I'm one example of, of many and, and I, I'm actually saddened how many of my colleagues have come up to me since I did say this to share their own experiences in the public, and I do worry that uh, we're dehumanizing pop, uh, politicians in a way that puts us all in danger. So thank you, Chair. I want to begin with you, Mr. al -Rawer. You had mentioned or proposed a nonpartisan fact-checking commission or body that might be able to separate out facts rather than opinions when it comes to misinformation and disinformation by MPs. Is that correct? And so That's correct. And so uh, we heard in subsequent testimony um, that there is the ability through both Mr. Lowen's media ecosystem, which collects data, and Mr. Frank's, uh, I believe, has some work around the dark crawler and the dark web. Uh, could, you, could you see this being taken up in an effective way by AI tools? Or is this something that you would see simply as being um, professional people subject matter experts in a in a you know human context trying to keep up with the scale of all the misinformation disinformation thank you very much for the question from my um somehow limited um, experience uh, working with ai tools the even the the uh, new ones i can um be certain to say that we haven't reached that stage yet 
uh, we still need humans to uh, qualitatively assess uh, pieces of information. Uh, there are, of course, cues that could be easily detected with other AI uh, tools. For example, if uh, an image is created by AI uh, technology, like we call them deepfakes or a video being deepfake, but there must be some kind of a qualitative assessment done by humans. Thank you. And just to, to round it up for you, sir, do you have other recommendations, legislation? I want you, if I were to be AI, I'll prompt you to say, pretend you're an MP, give us the best recommendations that you could to help counter some of the gaps and some of the threats that you've identified. I think this is a collective effort. I mean, I don't want to say that parliamentarians should do all the work alone. Everyone should be involved. Like, uh, I know that some NGOs were invited to this committee. I think they should also be involved in this work. So uh, we need to fact check each other, actually, including myself. I'll, I'll re-ask so. the question. I'll re-prompt you. Uh, we're here as member of parliament. At the end of this committee, we're going to be studying the testimony. The testimony will be comprised of not just what's wrong. We've spent a lot of time talking about what's wrong, probably still only scraping the surface. What we have to get from the testimony are recommendations. So understanding what our powers are, what our mandate is as a committee, what would you recommend to us that we adopt in our final report to help offset, certainly not to solve, not talking silver bullet, but offset some of the challenges that you've outlined? And then I'll put that question to the two other witnesses. I think... Uh... I'm not sure what to say here, but I, I believe that uh, the fact-checking initiative could be very useful uh, because, you know... Uh, yes. See, I will take Sorry. back my time, and I will go on to Mr. Frank. I do appreciate Thank somebody you. who says they don't have the answer. I have to say that all the time. Mr. Frank, what, what is it from your perspective that you would recommend to us for the consideration in a final report on this topic? I have lots to say, but um, a lot more than uh, the amount of time here. But... Um, a couple of main points. Uh, this has to be done by, with the help of AI. Uh, what we're seeing right now is just a preview. Um, th this is going to get significantly worse as the disinformation is going to be AI generated. Um, so the use of AI eventually will have to be done to detect this content, to de-escalate it, and to intervene. Um, during our studies, we've always employed um, humans, uh, domain experts, people of specific communities that uh, we wanted to detect uh, disinformation in. So the uh, approach that we've done, um, I think we successfully used, uh, was uh, to get members of the community to um, point out um, examples of uh, disinformation topics and then use that to build a um, or start to train an AI model, which then can pick up on this and, and uh, continue detecting um, news sources. It, it, with that model, given that you're, I'm to understand, and you can just say yes or no, is this the dark crawler model that you that you put um, into the dark web? It's it's within that context. So yes. given the vastness of that, could it, could an application not be set upon us as the 343 seats that will happen in the next election, including political parties? It seems like a very smaller digital ecosystem than the dark web. Um, it has to be done within each community. Um, if it is the members of parliament, that would be one community. Um, so we would need experts uh, who know what's going on, uh, who would be able to start pointing. we got 30 initial, seconds uh, left. Professor Lowen, if you could pontificate on recommendations. No, my apologies. I would say, Mr. Green, that we've decided in our, in our, in our country through, through a lot of legal wrangling, that we do allow the limiting of speech during elections. We limit it to politicians largely and to parties, and we limit how much third parties can speak. So, and that's, so that opens a legislative door for you to decide on, on what the arena will look like during elections. The challenge is that um, generating speech through AI is virtually costless, and it can be done by people who are not people. So the legislative framework that tries to limit which people can speak and limits how much they can speak through money is not fit for purpose for the world that Mr. Frank in particular is, is describing. So you need to find a way legislatively to try to maintain I think, the equilibrium that we have now in this new, in this new environment. This is interesting information. Um, before I get into my questions, uh, Mr. Frank in particular, I noted that uh, you ran out of time during your opening remarks. Uh, I'm, I'm willing to give you as much time as necessary. Do you think you could wrap things up in under a minute? 
Um, thank you. Um, I was going to uh, suggest a couple of um, positives uh, of what we should be doing. And um, I, again, I do appreciate the time. Um, my first suggestion uh, would be to establish uh, trust in journalistic sources uh, or somehow help establish trust. Um, I think we're losing it. A lot of people are getting their uh, news on uh, social media. We need to pull them back into trusted sources. Um, once we do that, um, I think uh, the people will be more robust against disinformation, but that needs proper funding. At the same time, the government can't be seen as the arbitrator of truth, um, so this has to be positioned carefully. Educational campaigns, uh, I've developed courses in my own um, for uh, these campaigns. Um, we just need to make people question more what they're seeing to make sure it is real. Um, the government is uh, or pledged a lot of money for research. That's excellent. Uh, we need that. Um, and I think we need to bring in AI into the discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to stick with you, uh, Mr. Frank, because I know my colleague, Mr. Barrett, uh, uh, sought uh, remarks from uh, Mr. Lowen with respect to his perceptions of Justice Hogue's interim report on foreign interference. I think all three of you would agree that uh, the misinformation, disinformation uh, campaign that has been happening for several years now, and at least uh, throughout the 2019-2021 election and currently, uh, in this country has substantially impacted Canadians' confidence in our democratic institutions. And that is something that we all as parliamentarians have to work on. But I want to I quote a couple of paragraphs uh, from Justice Hogue's report, and uh, Mr. Frank, I'd like to get your commentary on it. Uh, in your opening remarks, you spoke specifically about the candidate uh, Kenny Chu and uh, the impact of the uh, disinformation, misinformation campaign, not only from communist China, but as well as the liberal candidate who ultimately won the election and his participation in the process. I believe you also made reference to the fact that you were aware of Kenny Chu's testimony at this committee. Was that correct? Um, I, I know some of it, yes. Yes. So I'm going to quote a couple of paragraphs. Uh, she says, in the case of former Conservative MP Kenny Chu, the Commissioner identifies that there were strong indicators of Beijing's interference campaign that there was a reasonable possibility that this resulted in the defeat of Mr. Chu and the election of his Liberal opponent. It is also clear that as Canadians judge the actions of the Trudeau government and its failure to prevent this interference, that we must consider Commissioner Hogue's conclusion that the interference that was allowed to occur undermined public confidence in our elections. She notes that the risk of foreign interference in our elections will increase as long as the Liberal government fails to take sufficient protective measures to guard against it. Your comments, Mr. Frank. Um, I'm not a politician. Um, I'm a Canadian. I'm happy if any government uh, is able to implement a solution to this. Uh, but um, our trust is being attacked. Um, our trust in the election process is being attacked. We need to somehow fix this. During the Prime Minister's appearance uh, at the inquiry on foreign interference, he voiced frustration over intelligence, intelligence leaks to the media, which he felt were sensationalized and taken out of context. He claimed that his government had implemented robust mechanisms, his words, robust mechanisms to detect and combat interference, but was portrayed as negligent in the media. Do you believe this, this critique was justified? And do you think the government's efforts are sufficient? I'll put that to you, Mr. Frank, and I'd like to put the same question to the other two participants. 30 seconds uh, to do that. Um, given that there were leaks, uh, whatever measures were put in place obviously weren't enough. Um, I'm, I'm not privy of the details of what uh, were implemented, um, but I trust that uh, they did the best they could. Mr. Lord? I think there's an inherent challenge, Mr. Brock, in that, um, that uh, we, we are setting up a mechanism. There's a mechanism set up. For, for very good public servants to have a finger on, on the alarm bell, so to speak. Um, but the politicians to whom they report have conflicts of interest. In the, in the heat of an election, it's very hard for a prime minister to, or for a party leader 
to say, I want to tell everyone that my candidate has benefited from foreign interference. And I think fixing that conflict of interest okay. is, um, is a serious, is a serious uh, concern. Thank, Thank you. you. Perhaps you can get to uh, Mr. Al Rawi in the uh, next round. Uh, Do you think that there should be you. a prohibition of propagating uh, falsehoods during elections by politicians and political parties? I don't think that's possible. Uh, uh, and uh, I mean, I, I, agree, I agree with uh, Professor Lewin on this. Uh, it might uh, infringe on freedom of expression. You are free to say whatever you want. But of course, there sh should be some kind of repercussions uh, if you are saying uh, some lies. What I suggest uh, to address your question is that there needs to be more transparency uh, from the MPs about what they are claiming to, to, to uh, say. Uh, and also, yes. I'm going to end Excellent. there. I would, I would say with my 30 seconds left for your consideration, for the good and welfare of the committee, as subject matter experts, we're calling on you to help us contemplate these issues. You will have a week, likely, when this is done, um, to reflect on what's just been said and, and the testimony that you've provided. I would share with you that we have codes of conduct. I would share with you that if a minister came to this committee and lied, we would have the ability to provide accountability in that regard, to safeguard the information that we have in order to make informed decisions. But also the, the Deputy Prime Minister uh, posted a video that ended up being flagged on Twitter as being edited. You know, it was a montage basically taking, uh, uh, it was former Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole, a few different things he had said over the course of what was a, a, a more extensive conversation about health care, and it was posted as if it w was to say something that certainly uh, was, was not uh, w what was intended and certainly not what was said in the context of the larger sentence. So if I could ask just quickly, how, how do we make this balance? Because I hear often somebody say that when they disagree with you, oh, well, that's misinformation, disinformation, or hatred. Yet, when it comes to their opinions, if you oppose that, it becomes, this whole conversation gets, gets uber uh, torqued and, 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 and emphasized to the 10th degree. So how do we make sure that we bring it down to say, okay, actually, how do we deal with the facts? If I could, 15 seconds, maybe both of you. I would say very quickly, Mr. Kirk, that I think that example is a good one about the system working in some sense. Politicians frequently torque what their opponents have said, right? And they'll, and they'll take little turns of phrase. But in that case, m m the Deputy Prime Minister was sort of caught out in a sense, right, for having put out a video that, that, that I think unfairly probably pieced those words together. And, and she had to spend some time explaining that. So in some sense, that I think is kind of how you want the system to work, right? If you're going to if you're going to not truly represent what your opponent said or stands for and you get caught up for it, okay. then you have to explain why you did it. Thank you, Mr. Lowen. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Kirk, but we got, we got to move on because I'm allowing a little extra time here. We heard today that uh, disinformation propaganda has always existed, uh, and we realized that social media has given actors the ability to spread their messages at lightning speed, and, and it gets harder and harder to kind of bring those messages back in. I'll share with you kind of what the implications of that for, for myself has been. Uh, in 2017, um, I became the victim of, um, of a disinformation campaign amongst the conservatives uh, in their leadership campaign where they were uh, s sending out uh, fundraising emails asking, give us $5 and we'll stop uh, MP Ikra Khalid from bringing Sharia law into Canada. And that uh, led into, spiraled into a massive social media campaign against myself to the point where I had police patrolling my residence because somebody had released my address, encouraging uh, people to kill me. Um, I had uh, right-wing extremists uh, hanging out at my constituency office, terrorizing my community staff. So and 90,000 emails in my inbox, et cetera. And it took a very, very long time. And I, I still, to this day, deal with a lot of the consequences of that fundraising campaign that the conservative leadership in 2017 um, had led to. And so I, I really am curious to know, where does the responsibility lie here? Was it the conservative candidates raising money off of my personal safety and security by spreading disinformation? Was it social media platforms who allowed this to happen without removing it, without fact-checking? Or, or is it uh, media in general who are not playing the, the role of the watchdog that they perhaps used to in the past? And I'll start with, uh, with Professor Lowen and then go on to uh, Mr. Al-Rawi. Uh, Al Thank Got you. Got a minute. 
I'll, I'll just say that's a very hard question to answer, um, uh, Madam Khalid, about who is responsible for spreading a lie and for the downward effects of it, um, downstream effects of it. Um, and that doesn't mean it's not serious, but I, but I think it's probably a responsibility that's shared among people all the way down that down that chain. Um, but if politicians are spreading active falsehoods about other people, um, they have some responsibility for what people do with that information politically. Uh, Mr. El Rabi. Uh, thank you, MP. I'm very sorry to hear about this. I actually wrote two research studies, uh, peer-reviewed, uh, mentioning you. Um, I believe that uh, social media is to blame, partly, but also people's ideological beliefs that would, uh, you know, um, uh, prompt them to, to do so. Uh, unfortunately, this is the case. There is a lot of polarization happening, and some political parties use what I call disruptive identity politics. So they work on that issue in order to, again, mobilize some uh, significant of the communities, uh, I, I think, to probably win votes or uh, uh, create uh, tighter, uh, tighter communities, unfortunately. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, thank you for being here today. Uh, before I let you go, I do have a question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pose this question to all three of you, but I'm going to direct it first at Mr. Frank. Um, and it dealt with uh, your comment earlier in your testimony about trusted sources, credible sources of news uh, being lost. Uh, there was a time, Mr. Frank, and all of you know, that um, trusted news sources, whether it was uh, anchor people or news people, uh, were the go-to places for trusted sources. And now with social media, uh, the difficulty is finding uh, those trusted sources. And it's even more difficult now uh, because of uh, there, there's a standoff that's going on right now, and I'm sure you're all aware between Facebook uh, and the government as it relates to Bill C-18, uh, Facebook has made the decision, and Facebook for many Canadians is a source of information, but Facebook has made the decision uh, that they're not going to allow the sharing of links on uh, its platform from issues or from uh, uh, dailies like the Globe and Mail and others and paywall notwithstanding, I'm interested in hearing how uh, from each of you how uh, this situation is playing out uh, to allow further disinformation or misinformation, I call it lies, to be propagated on social media without access to these credible sources of information that are clearly flat fact checked, that are clearly vetted through legal departments, all of this information. If that information is not available on Facebook, uh, how much of an impact does that have on people's abilities to get the right information on social media? And I'll start with you, Mr. Frank, and then I will work uh, work around to Mr. Lowen and uh, Mr. Al Rawi. Mr. Frank? Yeah, um, the, um, this is a serious question. Um, a lot of people think um, anything they see on social media is is true and trustworthy. And I think um, educating them, saying th this is not a vetted, independent, uh, neutral source um, is one of the solutions to this. Um, newspapers are edited, they are fact-checked. Uh, we need to highlight other sources that are also neutral, fact-checked, edited, um, and we need to know that people understand the difference between the two. Okay, thank you. And I, I'm talking, uh, again, specifically as it relates to Facebook's decision not to allow links to these sources of information on their platform. So maybe think about that, but I'm going to go to Mr. Lowen next, uh, if he can answer the question for me. Yes, Mr. Bersarge. So our group did, uh, our research group has a little paper on this, which I'll send into the committee on what happened after the Facebook link ban and the one consequence of this is that people still feel like they're getting their news on Facebook uh, when you ask them about this. So they're not accessing news stories, but they are learning about politics from uh, from Facebook. Some news stories do creep through, but they're really learning about it from there. So they're learning about it then logically in a more content, in a more content free way. Um, but I'll just say one more thing, Mr. Sard, which is that the biggest and most important loss in, in journalism in our country has been the loss of local newspapers. And I think all of you as members who are members of long standing would know it really mattered what was reported on you in your local paper because people would read that about what you did in the constituency. Nobody writes about what you do in the Toronto Star back in your constituency. And that 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 loss of local journalism is the thing that in the long term will be uh, devastating to our democracy. Thank you, Mr. Lowe and Mr. Al-Rawi. 
Uh, thank you, uh, MP, for the question. I think if you look at the previous uh, surveys and studies, we see a very clear declining trust in mainstream media. And the, the, there are many reasons for that, including the failings of uh, some reporting of, about events around the world. Uh, so, of course, uh, we have social media emerging uh, back about a decade ago uh, and prompting people to uh, consume more news from there, and they got used to that. And it's a, a big challenge that we have today uh, following Facebook decision to uh, like ban news outlets uh, on this outlet because people got used to the news uh, from Facebook, but now they are uh, suddenly you know uh, uh, exposed to other sources. So that's the main challenge that we have today. But if I may just mention one thing, exposure doesn't mean impact or effect. It doesn't mean that if I am exposed to misinformation, I will be directly impacted by it. It's really important to make that distinction. Um, otherwise, we are not like sponges, uh, just absorbing everything we, we uh, get and immediately get influenced by it. So uh, we have different backgrounds, different ideologies, and of course, thoughts. So it's really useful to uh, be uh, more nuanced when we talk about this. And finally, I don't think TikTok is the problem. I think we have major other problems that we face today when it comes to the information ecosystem. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. al Rawi. And uh, Mr. Frank, did you have anything you'd like to add lastly, or did you say what you needed to say? Um, more or less, but um, I completely agree uh, with uh, others that uh, the social media being trusted as uh, a viable news source um, is what is causing the problem. Thank you, uh, gentlemen. Uh, on behalf of the committee and on behalf of Canadians, I want to thank you for your testimony uh, before the committee on this very important uh, study. Uh, thank you for taking the time out of your day to share your expertise and your information with the committee members. Thank you.